Hello, everybody. Miigwech, merci beaucoup, and thank you for joining us today for our Lunchtime Health Sciences webinar on managing burnout for healthcare professionals. The webinar is being delivered by Dr. Alexandra Drossen, a clinical psychologist employed with St. Joseph's Care Group. I'm Dr. Mike Ravenick, Director of the Health Sciences Programs at Nassim University. And before we get started, I'll do a land acknowledgement and formally introduce Dr. Drossen. This is a reminder to please keep your microphone off for the duration of the webinar, unless you are asking a question or responding to a question posed by the speaker. Uh, this will help to limit any background noise for everyone. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our Rehabilitation Sciences and Northern Ontario Dietetic Internship Program web pages. All of our previous health sciences webinars are also found on those web pages and on the NAWSOM YouTube channel. You can view these archived webinars at any time and receive a certificate for your professional development records when you complete an evaluation. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free uh, to put your questions in the chat and I will keep an eye on those uh, for Dr. Drossen. Uh, she, uh, has said that she will respond to questions throughout the presentation, but we will also have a formal Q&A period and discussion at the end of the webinar today. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, Nassim University respectfully acknowledges that our pan-Northern campus is on the homelands of First Nations and Métis peoples. The university buildings we occupy in Greater Sudbury and Thunder Bay are located on the territory of the Ishnabic Nation, and specifically Atikamishing and Wanapate First Nations, and Fort William First Nation. Beyond the land acknowledgement, we understand that reconciliation is a practice. We gratefully acknowledge the elders and knowledge keepers who share their gifts and teachings with us, so that we may better understand and honor their wisdom and all of the traditional keepers of this land. Nassim University will continue to practice reconciliation by listening, learning, and fostering a culture of mutual respect and trust. So as I mentioned, our speaker today is Dr. Drossen, who's a clinical psychologist and currently employed with St. Joseph's Care Group and Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Services, or CAPS. She works with children and adolescents diagnosing and treating a wide range of presenting problems, including anxiety, depression, behavioral difficulties, trauma, learning and attentional issues, and psychosis. Dr. Drossen primarily practices from a CBT orientation, but is integrative and incorporates a variety of different evidence-based approaches, including DBT, ACT, and mindfulness. She also manages a program of applied research at CAPS. Her research interests include the impact of sleep and screen use on pediatric mental health, transdiagnostic approaches to the assessment and treatment of mental disorders, rural and northern community well-being, and measure development and validation. She's published in several different peer-reviewed journals and presented her research at over 30 national and international conferences. Merci beaucoup, Miigwech, and thank you, Dr. Drossen, for your time today. We truly appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us and are very much looking forward to your talk and opportunities to ask questions on this very important topic. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and I'm going to try and share my screen now. Okay. So, um, today we're going to be talking about managing burnout, of course, and uh, before we get started, oh, there's me. So, uh, after that little introduction, a bit more about me, um, I find identity a really important part of um, my work and connection um, with colleagues as well, and so I always like to kind of identify myself. Uh, I did all of my training at LACAD, 
And I'm Sandra Bay, um, born and bred, a clinical psychologist. But what's important for today is I'm not your psychologist. And so while we talk, be talking about burnout and things that impact our health and well being, um, if there's anything that you're hoping to uh, implement for yourself, always recommended that you talk to your healthcare provider. I work with children and adolescents uh, in most of my jobs, but also work with adults. And uh, as Dr. Ravenick mentioned, I'm a researcher um, with a wide range of interests. Personally, though, I'm a wife and I'm a mom. I uh, am a yogi and I'm a lover of coffee, travel, my Peloton bike, and the color pink. And so now you might know a little bit more about me going into this presentation. In terms of disclosures, as was mentioned, I am an employee of St. Joseph's Care Group, um, but otherwise have no relationships with any um, for-profit or not-for-profit organizations. Um, I'm gonna talk about yoga. I don't know that this is a conflict, um, but in the spirit of disclosure, I have my yoga teacher training, although I don't uh, teach in any studios or anything like that. So we have two learning objectives today. First is to determine the signs and symptoms of burnout. So how do we know that we're experiencing burnout? And then two, learn skills in preventing and managing burnout when specifically working in healthcare. I'm going to talk about both um, personal and what I'll call like organizational impacts um, of burnout, but I focused mostly on the personal aspects and, and what you can do individually. Um, for this presentation. So, um, I also like to bring a bit of uh, humor, especially when we're discussing heavy topics uh, like burnout. So, I'm sure people have seen this meme before of this dog, and it, you know everything's fine, sitting there drinking his coffee, but the whole the whole building, the whole room around him is literally on fire and burning. And I feel like talking to my colleagues um, and even reflecting on places that I found myself in the past few years, sometimes um, work and life feel a little bit like this. Everything's on fire, everything's falling apart, we're really stressful, but we're keeping a lid on it and we're kind of uh, surviving, not thriving. So, you know, beyond the dog meme, <laughs> what is burnout? Uh, burnout is a three-dimensional effective response and I mean um, affective with an A, so emotions, not defective, uh, to continuous work-related stress. Um, and it's common in workplaces where employees spend a lot of time supporting others, or there is a large connection between your um, professionals and the people that benefit from their labor and their work. So it sounds exactly like healthcare, right? We spend a lot of time with our patients and our clients, and they benefit greatly and directly from the work that we do with them. Those three dimensions um, are emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and loss of personal accomplishment. And so the first, um, in terms of emotional exhaustion, is you know exactly what it sounds like, feeling like our emotional resources are being overextended and depleted, Often this does actually kind of bleed into physical exhaustion as well and feelings like we just can't, you know, muster up the energy to perform our tasks. Um, and, and what this might look like is, you know, the, the extras, the humanity is gone. So there's not necessarily time to include that bedside manner or chat with coworkers. We just don't feel like we have the resources to put ourselves out there in that way. Depersonalization um, talk, it represents kind of a, a, distan a, a distancing dimension of burnout. And so this refers to being negative or callous or excessively detached from our work and our job. Um, so that might be, you know, thoughts um, related to uh, being really frustrated or irritated with our clients or aspects of our job or coworkers. And then lastly, the loss of personal accomplishment is the self-evaluation component of burnout. And so this is where we feel like we are incompetent 
um, or we question our ability to do our job, um, despite having all of the training and knowledge and expertise. Um, and we also don't feel that sense of achievement when we're completing tasks related to, to our work. So when you work in, uh, oh, sorry, when you work in healthcare, particularly mental health care, you become really familiar with some classifications of disease like the DSM-5 and the ICD-11. So DSM-5 doesn't have burnout uh, in the book at all, but the ICD-11 put out by the World Health Organization does uh, consider burnout and they call it an occupational phenomenon, um, which I thought was interesting because while I do agree with the idea that um, it might result from chronic workplace stress, I feel like it's not uh, something that only affects people at work. Um, we don't leave a stressful job and go home and, and turn into a completely different person, right? We're bringing those things back and forth with us, but they're very clear that it's a phenomenon that can only occur in an occupational context and should not be applied to other areas of life. And as you can see, those three um, factors are very much the same looking at this formal criteria. So feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, the increased mental distance from our job or negativism or cynicism, and then reduced professional efficacy. And so through the ICD, you could actually be given a diagnosis of burnout from a, a healthcare professional. What does it look like? So how do we know we might be experiencing burnout? What are the symptoms? So we, we conceptualize the symptoms in four different domains, emotional, cognitive, social, and behavioral. Emotional symptoms might look like things like um, depression, or hopelessness about the future, helplessness, irritation, intolerance, um, cognitive symptoms, things like loss of meaning or values or confusion about our values, uh, feeling like we've lost creativity, we've lost direction, maybe even feeling distracted, which is something that we hear about a lot. Um, at work uh, and, and a general kind of critical outlook on things that, that glass half empty um, approach. Socially, um, you would experience or expect to experience social isolation or withdrawal. So feeling like you just did not want to connect with other people um, at work or at home. Um, maybe avoidance of occupational commitment. So again, kind of uh, hiding yourself away in your office and um, not trying to, to join the team or team aspects of your employment. And then in terms of behavioral, this is where we see things like absenteeism. So calling in sick or going on a, a stress leave potentially, um, avoidance of responsibility. So trying to uh, pass off certain responsibilities that maybe at one point you um, carried out putting off decision-making, procrastinating, again, something that's quite common when people actually present to, to mental health for support with um, burnout. Um, and then all sorts of other behaviors that you can imagine. So what we might call maladaptive coping strategies that people are gonna engage in to try and manage the other aspects of um, this, this burnout. There's a few different models that have been suggested in the literature on burnout. So initially there's uh, a 12 step burnout model from 1982 and it was um, modified at one point to be five step. And I really like certain aspects of this model. So what I've been talking about this for is really, you know, four and five where we are undeniably experiencing significant burnout. Um, it's having a large impact on our ability to function um, and we really don't see kind of a, a way out of it. But burnout can start uh, in a little bit more of a sneakier, insidious manner. And that's why we have that honeymoon phase at the top. So we see clients honeymooning a lot, not just with burnout, but basically with any change. When someone you know, switches uh, schools or uh, moves to a new city or um, leaves a relationship or gets a new job, we might see this period of um, optimism and enthusiasm for the role, 
everything's new and exciting. And we really feel like we are driven to prove ourselves, particularly if we identify as being high achieving. And this feels really good at first. So, you know, we get to work and our manager says, can you take that extra client today? You've been doing so well. Sure, I can do it. I'm here to prove myself. I've got the skills. And again, that's where that more insidious onset um, begins because we might bite off more than we can chew, take on more responsibilities than we have the capacity for. That moves into onset of stress. And so we've found ourselves in a state of overwork and we are maybe falling behind, having to stay late, having to do extra work, having to you know, work through lunch, uh, which is again a, kind of an early sign of things, moving into chronic stress. So now we've definitely got more on our plate than we can manage and we are falling behind potentially, and maybe people are noticing now. So um, we are neglecting our personal needs in the interest of completing our work tasks, working every night on our computer until late, not getting enough sleep. Again, moving into stages four and five of that burnout um, and habitual burnout where it becomes really difficult to, to function and do what we need to do both at work and um, at home. Okay, so <laughs> I'm watching this TV show, uh, Beef, on Netflix because it won a bunch of Emmys. So me and my husband thought, oh, we need to watch that. And in the first episode, uh, the main character said something, um, and I thought, oh, that's burnout. Uh, so sh the quote is, uh, there's always something. At some point, you think you get to relax, but no. And she's talking about her house here. There's too much moisture. I have to redo the cabinets. I have to redo the roof probably too. And by the time I'm done, I'm running out of money, the kitchen's out of style, and the whole time all I wanted was a hot tub. And so all we want is to do well, um, be recognized for our accomplishments, feel like we're contributing something, but often we're under this kind of mountain of responsibilities. And I hear my, my friends and my colleagues and my family members use this phrase, there's always something constantly to describe what they're dealing with in their life. I'm a psychologist, of course, I love to measure things. Um, and there's a few different ways to formally measure burnout. We've just described, you know, what it looks like, some of the symptoms that you might experience. But I do find people often struggle to think, am I experiencing burnout? Um, or are there other things that are, are getting in the way of um, my ability to, to do my job. So there's a few inventories that you can access. The Maslach Burnout Inventory is um, probably the most popular that you'll see in the literature, but it's behind a paywall. And so uh, in some places you can get a report for yourself for as little as $15, but it becomes a little bit um, prohibitive with the cost associated. And there's a few other inventories that are actually freely available, especially if you just download the article. And so I can um, make sure that those are circulated, the, the free ones or the links to the free ones, at least after the webinar, if you're interested. But one that I came upon is a single item uh, measure of burnout from uh, Doran et al. from 2022. And they found the single item um, measure was just as effective as completing a large battery of questions. And I like this because um, this is something that we can do quickly with ourselves. We can ask our coworkers. We can have it more formally implemented with um, maybe management to ask these kinds of questions. So overall, based on your definition of burnout, how would you rate your level of burnout? I also really like that they've used the idea of your definition of burnout because maybe it's not going to hit on all four of those symptom areas that we talked about before, but the functional impact on the person and their ability to do their job is just as significant. So we rate that from one till five and they have anchors for all five of them. But just to give you a sense at one, we have, I enjoy my work. I have no symptoms of burnout. Um, I kind of read that and thought, is anyone in healthcare going to say that? a bit facetiously, but um, number five is I feel completely burned out and I often wonder if I can go on. I'm at the point where I may need some changes or may need to seek out some sort of help. So again, the idea that if you're moving into three, 
you know, you know, you have symptoms of burnout or, or that five level, that's when we need to intervene and make sure that we are changing some things, um, whether that's more formally or informally to manage what we're experiencing. I've seen versions of this on social media. You don't pick a day to rest, your body's gonna pick one for you. And so burnout isn't just something that we live with and we think about and we answer surveys about, it has a real impact, um, both organizationally and of course, personally. Um, and then that extends to you know, everyone we might have contact with um, or have to provide some sort of care for. And so uh, in terms of impacts of burnout, um, organizationally, we see reduced productivity, people not being able to complete their tasks in a timely fashion or, or um, a sufficient number. There's of course lost work time or absenteeism, people calling in sick last minute is also very difficult in terms of um, covering those shifts and that results in short uh, staffing, which of course results in lower patient care. And um, even as much as uh, you know, mistake making is something that's strongly linked to burnout. And I would say that's that's reported mistakes. Um, there's, I'm sure there's many mistakes that we don't know about that aren't reported that people are making. Um, and the economic impact really can't be understated. I was shocked when I was looking into the dollars and cents of it um, that in the U.S. the economic impact of burnout per year is around 4.6 billion dollars so this is a huge issue um, and again not only does it have impacts for our patients um, it has impacts uh, at the economic level as well personally we see increased in mental health symptoms so of course anxiety and depression but also things like suicidal ideation and PTSD, it can certainly have uh, a post-traumatic reaction from a lot of things that you experience in healthcare. When we look at diagnosing PTSD, we talk about criterion A trauma, and that's a DSM term. DSM is Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's where we have all our criteria, and a criterion A trauma is what you need to, to meet criteria for a PTSD diagnosis. It's that first box you have to check, and that would be um, experiencing real or threatened death um, or violence or sexual violence or um, hearing about someone experiencing it in, a, um, in, in uh, that way as well. And so we know in healthcare, those kinds of things are coming up all the time. Um, we're seeing really significant uh, injuries, people experiencing really significant um, mental health uh, and, and physical health outcomes. So if that's not managed, um, and it leads to burnout, then again, PTSD can be related to that. Fatigue, um, so that exhaustion aspect. Pain is something that's highly linked to burnout as well. So uh, chronic pain, um, a lot of uh, talks about lower back pain in particular. Uh, for women, it's more, burnout is more strongly linked to uh, musculoskeletal disease. And in men, it's more strongly linked to cardiovascular disease. Mechanism is not totally clear on that. Substance use, of course, so people are going to turn to substances to manage. Lower self-esteem, and then even things like increased motor vehicle accidents. So, again, your your burnout isn't just going to be impacting your patients or clients, your family. It's going to have this really widespread ripple effect on your community. And we do know that there's particular groups of people who are at higher risk for burnout. Um, and so there's some individual factors being early in your career. You're often given kind of the um, short end of the stick in terms of things like shifts or holidays or even uh, managing lots of difficult patients. Having a, a lack of family or social support outside of work. Generally having low self-esteem. Um, negative attitudes about your job, and then a lack of leisure time or activities. Um, so again, reading all these things, I think it's very much a cycle because a lot of this is what starts to go when we do experience burnout, right? These are not just the risks, but the impacts, and you can see that cyclical nature of everything. Organizationally, lack of autonomy. So if we are being micromanaged, um, if we are not given much choice, 
in anything to do with our, our job, um, we're at risk for burnout. Poor leadership or communication. So leaders that aren't available or are not communicating with our staff or are not dealing with um, you know, conflicts on the team or issues that staff are bringing forward. Isolation. So working alone uh, is something that is highly linked to burnout. It removes any sort of support in the work environment. And we saw again a lot of that during um, COVID lockdowns, people experiencing a high degree of isolation who are used to working in an office environment or with many other um, people. Working on night shift for a prolonged amount of time. Again, I imagine this is partially related to the isolation of night shift. Uh, and then also that disruption in your circadian rhythm. And then exposure to traumatic events. And I would add to that traumatic events that are not processed properly and not attended to properly within the organization. I just mentioned COVID. We can't ignore the COVID impact. I am um, not going to say that COVID is over because I think that's factually incorrect. However, the um, lockdowns associated with COVID you know, generally do seem to uh, be over. And we know that this had a huge impact on burnout in a, a negative way. And so in a 2021 study found that the overall prevalence of burnout in healthcare providers uh, was 52%, so more than half of your workforce. Over the last 20 years, most studies find a, a rating around 32 to 34%. So that's still quite high, but then you're nearly doubling that. Um, and when you look at physicians and nurses in particular, they were reporting 66% um, were reporting being burnt out. And so again, if we have half of our staff in a state of burnout, we know what all the impacts are, um, that's going to have a significant impact on everyone. And, it, and it's just generally not something that we want. Okay, so a few memes to lighten things because that felt really doom and gloom when I was going through it. Um, but these are the things that I, see on Instagram that I know coworkers share with each other. And I feel like social media is a bit of a barometer for how we are dealing with these kinds of things uh, and issues in burnout and morale. Um, so saw this at work yesterday. It says on the whiteboard, are we running low on anything? Will to live. And you know, this would be something you'd send your coworker and you would both laugh, but maybe there is a bit of a grain of truth in that, that things are sliding into that burnout territory. And then who doesn't love the Simpsons? So when they ask you to show the new employee around, this is where I come to cry, cool. And again, um, that's the reality for some people is that work is, is so stressful that we're experiencing kind of that emotional upset. So like I said, memes are funny and they allow us to bring a little bit of a lightheartedness to a serious topic, um, but also recognizing that People are struggling and we need to, to support each other and ourselves. So how do we do that? There's a few different things that we can do that have some good evidence to support them. And I'm going to go through four different categories. As I mentioned before, I'm focusing more on the individual factors because I want people to leave here today and feel like they have some tools or ideas of things that they might be looking at implementing. Um, but certainly there are a number of organizational factors as well that um, are generally outside of the control of, um, you know, frontline employees, but that management and leadership can think about. So before we get started, though, let's talk a little bit about motivation and initiation. These are really important when we're looking at starting new habits, and I would say that all of the strategies we're going to talk about are, are habit based. Um, so, we look at uh, motivation as something that is suddenly going to fall in our lap one day. We're going to be motivated to put that new habit in place, and that's really not how it works. Um, activity and behavior beget motivation. And so, that initiation piece, that first step is super important. Um, and sometimes that does look like uh, doing something that we don't want to do in the short term, but in the long term, we know is a good choice for us. When we look at motivation, though, um, we are more motivated by uh, intrinsic uh, values than extra extrinsic. So 
intrinsic being things that we choose freely that we have a sense of autonomy over versus extrinsic um, being that we are you know essentially forced into to doing and so uh, i think that's interesting when we think about maybe some of the health wellness initiatives that um, are sometimes offered you know team building exercises and things like that we really want to make sure that when we're choosing something to implement it's intrinsically motivated we'd like to do it it aligns with our values as opposed to um, just being motivated by an external reward like a paycheck um, there's also an aspect of motivation extrinsic motivation uh, called integration and this would be uh, the closest form of extrinsic motivation um, to intrinsic motivation and that's when um, we've been presented with reasons for why to implement something or change uh, a behavior and we're able to integrate those reasons into our own personal value system um, and understand why it would be helpful for us to begin um, a new habit or, or integrate something. Interestingly, a lot of this work on motivation, particularly in healthcare, is in hand washing. Um, and so trying to relate it to burnout sometimes uh, was challenging. Um, but overall, we know that um, intrinsic motivation and that autonomy to make that choice is um, more related to maintaining habits um, and um, having less kind of uh, failed attempts. Another aspect um, when we think about building habits is like I mentioned values and, and getting a sense of what our values are um, because uh, that's an important piece of the puzzle, making sure that we actually get enjoyment and pleasure from what we're choosing. If you, you know, choose an activity to, to integrate into your day and you don't enjoy it, it's not gonna last very long. So the factors that we discussed previously were more, um, I guess, abstract when you think about motivation and initiation for change, but there's some real um, practical aspects as well I wanted to talk about. And so some people may be familiar with smart goals um, and that approach as well to behavior change. So I'm, I'm drawing upon some of that in here. Feasibility is really important. So what most of us have competing demands and very busy schedules um, and that we know is a factor in burnout alone. So really getting realistic about how much time we might have available to dedicate to any of these um, new habits or changes is important. Uh, for example, my children wake up at six. I would love to get on my Peloton bike in the morning, but that would necessi necessitate me waking up at five and that I wouldn't give me enough sleep. So despite being a really good idea on paper, practically I wouldn't be able to sustain that habit and it would have negative impacts elsewhere if I'm not getting enough sleep. Finances is also important to consider. And so sometimes we want to um, build a new habit that requires an investment in something and we have to make sure that we have the finances for that investment. And that's sometimes where an organization can help support um, maybe access to a certain service or provide some funding towards um, purchasing equipment or services. And again, of course, equipment, like I just mentioned, we have to, if we're going to start um, a cooking group, we have to have access to a kitchen. Uh, and accessibility in all of these things. So uh, we have to know if we are able to access it in our area, which is sometimes a barrier in the north, and um, knowing where to access it. When we look at building habits, though, there's three strategies that are super important. So behavior repetition, context cues, and rewards. So we want to think about those three things as we move into more of the um, strategies. So physical activity is the first one, probably no surprise, uh, but it has great research in both protecting uh, from burnout and also reducing burnout. And it's most strongly related to that um, exhaustion aspect of burnout um, and the reported fatigue that's an outcome of burnout. We have a nice little cycle here though, I guess, not nice, um, where when people uh, don't engage in physical activity, they report higher levels of fatigue. And the reason that people don't engage in physical activity is because of the fatigue. 
So we're fatigued. We don't engage in physical activity. Because we miss that activity, we experience more fatigue. And again, the cycle goes on. This is where that motivation or initiation piece comes in. I'm tired. However, I'm going to move my body. This is particularly important for women as well, because women generally report less physical activity than their male counterparts. In terms of benefits, though, again, preventing and reducing burnout through a few different mechanisms uh, and physical fitness being one of them. We know it improves um, musculoskeletal structure, protects against some of the pain outcomes, um, improves the insulin circuit and the hormone system and improves our metabolism as well. And so physical activity can look as simple as going for a short walk on a break. So instead of sitting and having uh, coffee, uh, maybe we stand up and we do a loop around the building or um, a loop in the building, for example. Uh, so any, any aspect of movement is going to be helpful. And of course, it, it can also look like, you know, something like skiing or taking a class, something more formal. The second uh, strategy category is, I called it mind-body modality. They saw that in the literature and I liked it. And so a mind-body modality is a health practice that combines mental focus, controlled breathing, and body movements to help relax the mind and body. And so yoga, of course, mindfulness or any sort of meditation, also Tai Chi, and then even prayer or faith-based activities are going to potentially fall into this like MBM category. So the research on yoga is actually, I would almost say shocking. Um, it's so strong, especially when it relates to burnout. And so we know that yoga decreases cortisol, which is related to subjective levels of stress. It reduce, reduces blood pressure as well. Overall improved physical fitness and cognitive functioning. So that ability to focus and pay attention and concentrate uh, and overall just reduce subjective stress, reduced reported symptoms of anxiety and to a lesser degree um, depression as well. What I'll also say is uh, this is a beautiful picture of a person doing like full expression dance or pose on a beach that is nowhere near northern Ontario. Um, and this is sometimes what people imagine in their head when they think of yoga. Um, and, you know, I couldn't find a stock photo of anything but this kind of representation of yoga. So I spared everyone from a photo of me doing it. Um, but yoga is a, a practice and it's accessible for everyone. And um, we shouldn't feel like we can't participate because, you know, this isn't our reality. Um, and so any, again, just like physical activity, any small amount of movement is beneficial. And they've shown that even kind of 10 minute short yoga videos uh, can really be helpful for that subjective stress in particular. So you're probably getting the sense, you know, anything is better than nothing is kind of um, the, the ground level of this. Got a happy brain here. Um, so mindfulness or MBSR, which is mindfulness based stress reduction. Uh, mindfulness is uh, becoming more and more popular, which I love, and it's got, again, great evidence to support. But all mindfulness is, is paying attention on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And that non-judgmental piece, I feel like, is the one that sometimes gets dropped, but it's actually maybe the most important when it comes to burnout. So what do I mean by that? Uh, oh, there's John kabat -Zinn. So he uh, is credited as one of the people who brought mindfulness to kind of the Western world. Um, but um, mindfulness uh, is as simple as training our brain to eliminate the emotional connection uh, to things when that emotional connection is causing us distress. So what do I mean by that? Um, we are at work. And uh, we realize that we're short staffed and a couple employees have called in sick that day. Most people's initial reaction is one of frustration, anger, maybe like some sadness or despair, realizing that today is going to be just like yesterday and I'm going to be run off my feet. Uh, and mindfulness practice in that moment would challenge us to remove that judgmental nature of it, where we are 
mind reading or trying to fortune tell that today is going to be terrible. I'm going to feel awful all day um, and recognize, okay, I'm here right now and everything is okay. And that's kind of the core of mindfulness is that usually the present moment is okay. When we live in the past or we live in the future, that's when things start to become a little bit more distressing for us. If you're interested in mindfulness, and again, I'll um, make sure that these resources are, are shared after, uh, there is an app that's great called Insight Timer. And it's, uh, they do have some paid versions now, but a huge free library of different meditations and even courses. And then if you're really interested in mindfulness and from that stress reduction perspective, um, there is something called Palouse Mindfulness that John Kabat-Zinn created. And it's a 100% free online eight week MBSR course um, that you can go through and get a certificate after and that we use in um, mental health care pretty regularly. So why is this so great? Um, again, the research is almost shocking when we look at um, these MBMs, these mind-body modalities. So the first example I have there um, is of a really intensive training uh, program that one hospital implemented um, with nursing staff. And so it was eight sessions that lasted two and a half hours each, plus a one hour sit per day. And a sit is just the practice of being mindful um, in, a, uh, in a more formalized way. So we do sit and we just practice mindfulness for that hour. And it can be really frustrating and bring up a lot of emotions, especially if we're new to it. But this study found um, a large reduction in mood symptoms and a moderate reduction in burnout. We also know that um, there's a reduction in pain associated with mindfulness um, and this better ability to focus. With this, we can maybe suggest that there is going to be an enhanced professional accomplishment, right? That's one of those three factors of burnout. If we're able to focus more and really see the nuances in the clinical work that we're doing, we are better able to accurately assess what our professional accomplishments are. We notice when we do a good job, we notice when other people do a good job. Um, and when we're fully invested in our work, we can feel, we can feel good about that. It also uh, suggested or known really that mindfulness um, enhances psychological flexibility and that's where that non judgmental piece comes into play. So, again, we're starting to shift. We know we're going to be short staffed and we are starting to kind of create this story in our head about how the day is going to go and how horrible we're going to feel. That's valid because we've had that experience in the past. And what's also true is that we can't tell the future. And so today might go very differently than previous days. And that's called psychological flexibility, that capacity to hold the idea of multiple outcomes at one point and also challenge some of that negativity. Our brains aren't meant to keep us happy. Our brains are meant to keep us alive and they are meant to look for negative um, aspects of our environment. And so if we don't challenge that uh, natural um, ability of our brains that, that does great things in other settings, um, we can't develop psychological flexibility, which again, um, can lead to more of the despair and negativity related to burnout. And the, you know, the, the job um, realm, we know that these is mindfulness and these MBMs are related to uh, increased job satisfaction and role efficacy as well. Um, and again, that perception of our performance on the job is enhanced. Social support really cannot be underscored as well. And um, when we think about social support, it's assistance and protection given by others. And so it can be formal or informal. It can be as simple as sending a text to a friend or a loved one. I had a hard day, you know, can we talk? Or just even you know, sharing a meme, that's a form of social support or accessing social support. But coworkers are really important in this place too. And that's why when we work in isolation or isolate ourselves from our coworkers, we are at a higher risk of burnout. So if you don't have some valued coworkers that you um, spend time with at work, maybe outside of your, your clinical work, um, it'd be helpful to try and find those people as well. They can be really powerful for our mental well-being and reducing burnout. 
So there's four aspects of social support that you can access. And I think most people will realize that they tend to um, give and also maybe receive one of these much more than the others. Um, so thinking about creative ways to uh, give and, and maybe ask for other forms of support could be helpful as well. So emotional support is exactly what it sounds like. Expressions of love or caring or support from our, our loved ones. Instrumental support is when uh, someone does something for us. And so we text our partner that we've had a really hard day and they say, don't worry about dinner. I'm going to uh, take care of that. Informational is when someone provides some facts about um, you know, what you're going through for you to consider. And so that might be the coworker scene. You know, I just attended this talk on burnout. Have you ever heard about it before? You know, can I give you some information? And then a value of appraisal support is related to um, getting information about how we're performing that can be helpful for us to evaluate ourselves. And so that's things like performance appraisals that we do regularly with leadership, but maybe also those quick um, boosts for our coworkers. Hey, you did a really great job with Nancy over there. She seemed to really enjoy um, what you did with her. Uh, that can be um, really beneficial. And so people have things like huddles built in at work or kind of um, ways of uh, recognizing or congratulating other um, coworkers as well. I wanted to talk about this idea of brief interventions too, and this isn't something really um, classified in the literature, but I know when we're starting this new habit or thinking about these things, it can feel really overwhelming. Like, oh, okay, I'll, I have to start an exercise program. I've got to go and buy skis and buy a ski membership, or I got to do an eight week mindfulness course. Like a lot of these things are intense. And these are other ideas here on the slide that you can do this afternoon. Um, so check-ins. Um, that single item measure that I mentioned before, Overall, according to your definition of burnout, what is your current level of burnout? That's something we can do with ourselves every day, maybe, or we can um, do that with team members and ask that question and just make that question kind of normal in our workplace. That's important in preventing and managing burnout. Um, taking your breaks. So we often forego our breaks and we stay on our computer um, or we kind of uh, eat our lunch in our office while we're doing some paperwork or we sit in that other client that really needed to see us and we know we aren't machines we deserve a break too and so taking again even a 10 minute break to do something intentionally uh, for our health like a yoga video or taking a short walk is really important so moving away from your workstation um, and, and taking that break from work opening your door um, so that's something that targets that isolation aspect. I have a policy that I never send an email if I'm able to go speak to the person. Um, and this is, uh, people notice this, people have, more than one person has commented on that about me. Um, some people maybe find it annoying, but I like that connection that uh, the face-to-face the -face interaction provides. And I find that that's better for my um, well-being and also just my way of working on a team and um, I'll often follow up with an email after but I like to check in with the person and opening your door kind of invites those check-ins as well. I said making a different choice. I don't like to use the word healthy in this context because that feels like a value judgment but we have small choices that we make every day um, that sum up the, to us and to our experience and so maybe it's um, changing what we buy, you know, in the cafeteria as a snack or going to half calf coffee um, because we know the full caffeine is not going to make us feel very well um, or bringing our water bottle with us. All these little things that we can do and make different choices um, throughout the day. Sneaking in movement. So using a sit stand desk if we have that going for a quick walk for five or 10 minutes on our break, doing a yoga video, joining those initiatives. Um, again, small amounts are gonna be really helpful for the preventing and managing of burnout. And then taking a mindful moment. So practicing that mindfulness, 
even if it's a short meditation on insight timer or on YouTube, or just practicing yourself kind of closing your eyes and paying attention on purpose in the present moment and practicing that non judgmental aspect. So, I think um, I am right on time, which actually thrills me, um, but thank you very much everyone. Um, and I welcome any questions or thoughts. Of course, I have reference uh, a list of references as well that I can also circulate if you're interested in digging into the literature um, a bit more. Thank you so much, Dr. Drossen. That was uh, fantastic. And, and thank you as well for the offer to uh, share references and resources. And I, I will make sure that those are included in the email that will go out. Uh, that will also include the evaluation uh, for the session. So I, we will turn our attention to some questions. And, and Becky, I see that your hand is up. Did you want to take yourself off mute and, and ask your question? Sure. Um, my question is, how much do you think the culture of uh, becoming and working as a healthcare professional contributes to people um, working beyond their limits? It's a great question. Um, and when you know you dig into the literature, that is really its entire own webinar. Um, so that's um, equally as important to these individual factors. Uh, and uh, we know that the things that are putting us at risk for burnout a lot of the time are out of our control. So, you know, the shift schedule, um, maybe poor communication or leadership um, being micromanaged. So that absolutely has an impact on it. And then we do know that when you think about becoming a healthcare professional and that training, that's something that they talk about a, a lot more now um, in the, the training world. And there's several uh, there's was several studies I came upon looking at like integrating um, some of these practices into training and ensuring that students are receiving this information while they're um, in school and being encouraged to kind of consider that work life balance before they enter employment. Uh, one study that was so fascinating that I didn't mention but related to yoga was talking about pairing yoga with physiology courses. And so they would learn the physiology um, of the body, but they would also learn yoga in conjunction with that and to encourage um, that practice. Any other questions or comments, thoughts regarding the, the presentation today? Sheila, yeah. Thanks, Mike, and and thanks, Alex. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation, and you couldn't hear me, but I was laughing here at some of your memes. Um, it struck me at one point in the presentation that the, the concept of quiet quitting, and um, I mean that's something that I think I experienced somewhat during the COVID experience, and it was like an easy way to withdraw a little bit. Uh, from the comfort of my living room. And so I wonder if there's some relationship and what you've read about an overlap between the quiet quitting and burnout. Mm -hmm. I would say there's probably a few ways that it relates. One on the, so, so the idea of quiet quitting, um, for people that might not be familiar with it, is the kind of doing the minimum at your um, job and maybe withdrawing from any of those extra things that you may have participated in before. Um, and I think on one hand, that kind of um, behavior might be protective. The people are recognizing I'm feeling burnt out. I'm feeling like I don't have enough capacity to handle all of this. I'm going to pull back from some of the extras. That can be a way to, to maybe protect yourself from worse outcomes and manage that. Um, and then on the flip side, I've seen it uh, talked about as like a way to um, I'm trying to think of a different phrase, um, but like uh, stick it to the boss. So I'm right. I'm going to uh, be difficult maybe, or I'm going to stop, you know, doing these extra things that have been asked of me with the purpose of, um, and I'm going to show you. So 
definitely relates to this topic. I think, like I said, on both ends, the people who are trying to prevent burnout, and maybe the people who are already there um, and trying to cope with it in uh, less helpful ways. Becky, yes, you have a question. Sorry, I just have another question about um, this is a different question, but stress leave. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I just was wondering about the benefits of stress leave, given that you are most likely coming back to the same situation. I don't. That's a great question. I am certainly not um, a human resources professional, and so I don't know that I can really even answer that question. I would be hopeful that if someone was going on a stress leave and it was communicated that the reason for that was due to workplace stress, uh, that would be considered in the return to work plan. Um, but I don't really have um, experience with that. I did want to, to comment. I, I think that the one, one item five point scale uh, that you you had suggested it would be incredibly beneficial for anyone to do on a, a daily basis just to check how they're personally feeling. Uh, it seems very simple rather than pulling out an, an inventory every day. So the, thank you for sharing that. And I mean, the five step progression uh, was also helpful in, in being able to kind of reflect on where you are. Um, maybe day to day, week to week, month to month, uh, whatever you think would be most most helpful, and and then being able to draw on, on some of those strategies that you had uh, reviewed that uh, I, I very much appreciated are, are evidence based uh, as, as well as some personal strategies that you uh, have found helpful yourself. I wanted to, to ask. I, I know this wasn't part of your presentation, but you alluded to. Alluded to it as part of uh, how burnout can be managed. That there's kind of the personal strategies, but also organizational strategies. And although it wasn't the focus uh, of your talk today, I, are there big buckets or, or kind of main strategies that perhaps a manager or organization I, might look at uh, in trying to help uh, employees and staff manage with burnout? It's a great question. Um, I do. I think a lot of the strategies, and again, from the evidence base, it's a lot of crossover um, or or kind of using those same strategies, but in a more organizational way. So, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the social support. So, encouraging team building activities, um, right? Or um, having wellness incentives um, or wellness activities like bringing. So, so one thing is, you know, the accessibility of some of this stuff is difficult for people. So maybe the employer can bring the yoga instructor to the center and people can sign up there. Um, I think generally one thing I saw and some of the comments made around um, realizing people employees are people and considering the holistic person and not focusing so much on um, the um, the productivity or uh, the you know again the micromanaging aspect but giving people a little bit of autonomy um, with things like their schedule or um, with you know clients or decision making capacity can really go a long way as well so I think there's organizational strategies that can be implemented kind of organization wide or, or bigger. And then at the same time, there's ways that, uh, you know, individual managers and leaders can interact with their staff differently to help support um, this as well. Thank you. And there's been a number of comments in the chat, just thanking you. I am sure that you can see them as well. And, Michelle commented that Insight Timer is her favorite. It's poorly named. No one knows what it is, but it's, I mean, Insight, sure, from the Buddhist perspective, but anyways, it's great. Everyone should download Insight Timer. So thank you, everyone. Um,
I really appreciated being able to share with you. And if there are any uh, follow up questions or people wanted to connect, you can also make sure that my email is um, sent to you as well. Thank you so much. Heidi, any final questions? Great. Thank you once again, Dr. Grossman. I uh, truly appreciate it. We will send out those resources uh, uh, shortly, uh, as well as the evaluation. I hope you all have a fantastic day and, and that you'll join us at the next webinar uh, in February. Thank you so much.